Well, thank you, everybody, for uh, coming today. Some of you may have done the all-day meditation yesterday and have come back for more today. Um, wonderful. Now, today I uh, was asked to give some teachings, if I can prop this up, to give some teachings on what it is, uh, what the Bodhisattva path is in the Mahayana. And um, I thought, well, that's a very large and complex topic. But I could simplify it down to working with what we call the aspects within the paramitas, the sixth paramita in the Mahayana and the Zen tradition and the Tibetan. They all seem to be differentiated these days. And uh, so I was going to get you to put the picture. Um, I want to also share some of these teachings with my old teacher. Now she's 80, just turned 88 and they must have had a celebration. I'm not sure this here is the celebration of her 88th birthday, but they've given her a, I see a lolly mandala, a mala. <laughs> and, uh, but she is still very upright and very bright and still teaches, you know, at least two hours, most days, three or four days in the week. And she does, uh, she studies herself for several hours and she does calligraphy for two hours a day. So at 88, she is still practicing and um, delivering to the community of nuns. There are about um, 150 nuns in the training school that she developed over 40 years ago. I think about 50 years ago she began that school. And the teachers um, have all trained under her and also in Korea itself, many of the senior teachers have trained in this school. It is the largest uh, training school in Korea for nuns, this four-year training. And uh, so I just thought there are so many qualities in the parameter that bring to mind her actions or what I have perceived of her actions over the years. And so as I go through these virtues, I wish to uh, reflect and honor her life. Um, now these virtues, uh, what we call the parami, is um, the qualities, both in Theravada and Mahayana, which are the qualities we develop to overcome the suffering and also to stabilize our mind in the practice. And for a, a parami, the para aspect of parami means the other shore and the me means to uh, to go over to or to um, uh, we say in the heart sutra gone 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 beyond to go beyond to go beyond this realm of complexity and difficulty into the world and realm of um, the enlightened realm of Nibbana. So the parami as um, taught in, in my tradition, in the Mahayana tradition, are the, the six parami, that of dana. Then we have the, um, the parami of um, the sila, the parami of the um, patience or kanti as um, in, shared in the Theravada words, the parami of um, endurance and, and great effort, then the parami of concentration and that of uh, wisdom. So I want to speak in particular with these parami as I go through them, which is the, the aspects of the three, each have a, th 
three aspects to them, have three facets, you might say, in how we develop these perfections. And I want to uh, speak to this in particular today. So with dhyana, the dhyana parami, which is often said to be the benevolent generosity, it is the generosity that develops benevolence, develops loving kindness and compassion. And uh, you know the the aspect is um, not only the overcoming of the difficulty and the misery and poverty, but it is also um, to to overcome our greed and our attachments, in particular our greed. And so the three. Um, the three types, you might say, of benevolent generosity, one is that in material gifts, which is the very, um, the basic level. It is something that we all know, the more we let go of, the more we, we relinquish, the more we give, then the more we feel uh, this sense of um, comfort and, and, and warmth and kindness within ourselves. It is a, it's a mutual uh, sense of both giving and receiving at the same time. And the Buddha taught a lot about this. I mean, the very act of his, uh, the dana, which in, in the, the receiving of the dana is the main meal in the day, in the Buddha's receiving, then also he would teach the dhamma. He would teach the teachings um, to, to benefit the, the, the donors of the, the offerers of this, this meal which nourished the monks and their bodies. And so I think that the, this reciprocal um, aspect of this giving and receiving is a very important aspect here. It is also a generosity um, that helps to protect and, uh, and helps to ward us from any danger when we give our lives, you know, the, there was a great master, which I've mentioned before, the great Wehe, he said, if you give 100% yourself to the dana parami, which is to give your life to the Dhamma, then there is a great protection and there is a great um, sense of freedom that comes from that. And that will be covered a little bit more later, but it is the protection as a mother or a parent to their child. The child, if well looked after, is well uh, nourished by the offerings of the parent, the nurturing of the parent, that child feels very safe and very secure. And so the Dhamma, the, from the perspective of, of generosity, it, it makes us feel very wholesome and very content. But the most beneficial form of generosity is that in the capacity to be able to teach the Dharma. Not only to be able to teach it, but to teach what helps people change, what helps us grow, what helps us um, see into the depth of the truth of the Dharma. If it is only about uh, my teaching for my own uh, prestige, importance, for my own purpose, it is a very limited teaching. But um, when it is not about my gain, it is about helping another realize in that moment something that is going to benefit their whole life. Even if it is one word, even if you do not know very much in the way of the Buddhist teachings, but you can say something out of the depth of sincere kindness and compassion that helps another. Or you can act in a way out of sincere kindness and compassion that can benefit another. This is the greatest giving. I mean, just to give a whole hour's talk on dana would not cover it. It takes a whole lifetime. And when I consider of my teachers giving for, I mean, she became a nun at the age of 17 or 18 and became um, 
she received two PhDs, became uh, a teacher. She started this school with a group of friends, other monastic friends, and it grew to be the largest. I had over 250 at the time of its, when there were a lot of people ordaining, at the time of it being, uh, um, the, t the teachings being very appreciated in Korea. But still, she has guided all the senior lecturers and she gives. I watch her in every aspect of the day, from the early morning to when she goes to bed, there's not a moment she's not giving. You know, she has two attendants, but she is always looking after their needs. She, she would look after visitors for many hours. She worked in the garden for two or three hours, and she's built big communal gardens and worked with the builders, still taught for three hours and did her own studies, private studies. And often she didn't sleep. She would be um, she had a practice of, after she had done her calligraphy, she would roll it up, the paper up, and she would make things of it in the nights because she wasn't sleeping. So that became something that became later gifts that she gave to people. So there was always how to live that very full life from three o'clock in the morning till 10 or 11 when you go to, to bed at night of pure dana, pure giving. And uh, the, the ethical discipline enables, as I've said, not only the well-being, but a characteristic, it's characterized, or its characteristic is that of non-violence. And, oh, we've, we're getting into the ethical, sorry, the ethical discipline here. Um, so, um, I'm starting now on the next, which is the training of not only the Vinaya, such as for the monks and nuns, or the, the training in the five precepts or ten precepts they have in Mahayana, but it is a training in what soothes and what cools the mind. That is its meaning. The, the word sila means to cool or to soothe, and its ethical discipline is to enable well-being again, and, uh, and non-violence, non-harming, not hurting in any way other sentient beings. So it has this core reason to practice in an ethical way. And we're learning now, you know, what we see about this, this war on waste in a very secular way, is starting to realize how what we do is affecting not only our own families right here and now, but the future of our, our generations and this, this planet. So we're starting to look on that very secular level what actions we do are going to have very great repercussions in the future. Not only from the psychological hurt we can do to another, or harm we can do to another, but the, the deep-rooted physical actions. Now, the very grosser, of course, is the ones that um, you know, directly come from our body, speech, and mind. And these, these are very present in our life. You know, a little raised voice can end up into an argument that ends up hurting us hurting the family, hurting our friends, hurting our relationships in the workplace. And, uh, you know, to cultivate this virtue has the potential to make us more cohesive, more unthreatening, and more able to, to connect very easily. There was, uh, you know, in the case of the, the time of the Buddha, you know, when we go through the five precepts, you know, one of them is, uh, you know, the capacity not to take, you know, not to steal. 
And one of the things that the Buddha discovered in this, um, in this relationship of, of what is ours and what is others is that the thread of this thought from even just coveting, even, even just on a, on a level of, oh, I like that, that it instills deeply in our way of thinking a pattern that becomes not only I like it, but gee, you know, what if I can have it? What if, if I get it, then what it's going to do, to do for me? You know, we start to gain these ideas about what it is in the relationship of having. So in cultivating the, um, the virtue of our, our precepts is to cultivate this way of, in a way, not having or not having to have or not desiring. And this again frees the mind to, um, you know, in a way that is very uh, liberating. So we have more time, we have more capacity to be and do what is very important. I'm just trying to find my notes here and my computer keeps jumping all over the, the place. One of the things... Um, that the Buddha said he had a disciple who couldn't give anything away. He was always hanging on to everything that stayed in his hand, in particular money. And so the Buddha taught him by first just learning to give it to the other hand. Give it to yourself and see what that feels like. You know, if you've ever had that sort of sticky attachment where, you know, I. I see it even in myself, where, you know, you, you find it very difficult to let go. And so what happens is you first learn to give it to yourself, appreciate it. So when you receive something, appreciate it. And then slowly learn to let it go. Of course, in the, in the perspective of... of the precepts of Sila is not to, the main is not to kill, not to take life, but to generate life, not to take what others are not giving, not to abuse others through sexual misconduct, or abuse yourself. And primarily it is, we, we first start here we hurt here first, before we have hurt out there. You recognize that more the, the more you meditate. When you even think to do something that is not in, in tune with your deeper truth, you start to feel a little uncomfortable. You hurt inside. You get heated, you get agitated. If you're feeling some sort of sense of irritation and agitation and you look inside, you will see what's not right. You will see where somehow the sealer is not correct. And so we learn by letting go of these negative um, behaviors, ne negative habits, or at least looking into them. They should relinquish by themselves the more we look at them, the more we see they are not of any benefit to myself and others. Then slowly they start to, to you know, dissipate, become weaker and of, of less use to us. The next is the, um, the parameter patience. Um, patience is very interesting and I, I put this also down to my teacher as a great quality. I mean she had excellent sealers. She was, she was the, um, the master of um, bhikkhuni ordinations for 
for much of her, she was always the younger one among the very senior ordinating teachers, masters, but she became the senior nun. So apart from the fact that her own sealer and her own um, dedication to the bhikkhuni order was very strong, she had this quality of patience. I've never seen it so ingrained. My, my uh, great monk teacher, Kusan, had this too. And also my uh, very, one of my first teachers, Kanti Palo, in his earlier years, I saw that. It was a character, a quality he was trying to develop. But I saw that also in his, um, his character, and it's there now in his old age, where he has to put up with a lot in the nursing homes, and he has the mind to do it. So this forbearing, forbearing patience is applying action of forbearing in situations that are disturbing, frustrating, and upsetting, and not letting our mind get angry or become, become over, overcome by it, the anger and mental agitations. And the aspects of patience is about being able to deal with these adversities in life. You know, I've often said that the, uh, the Chinese character is the heart with the knife above it, which is slicing away the ignorance, slicing away the unwholesome thoughts, slicing away that which is not conducive to our life and our meditation and our practice. And here in this quality of patience, forbearing patience, forbearance in itself is a, an aspect of patience. Forbearance and endurance, these are all qualities of being able to stay with, to be with, to allow the mind to um, connect with whatever is in front of us and not be fearful, not turn away, not react. How we can be steadfast in the most difficult situations and when other people are hurting or wanting to harm us, it's important to also realize that we are part of that anger. We are part of that argument. We are part of that disagreement. And you know, it's, it's quite an interesting thing to look at it. Um, it's how our mind plays with what it is we're having conflict with. One moment, it's sort of trying to agree, trying to compromise. And the next moment, it takes its stand of righteousness and the differences become very different. You know, you and me become worlds apart. Your views and mine, your religion and mine, your, your education and mine, we, we see each other from a far away. And when it becomes very strong, you know, it's quite interesting. There is this saying here, we don't get angry at a stick. You know, the stick that we whack a person with. When meditation, they used to or hit us over the shoulders with a stick. And, you know, sometimes it really hurt. And you, you want to get angry, but you take it out on the person, not the stick. And that's a little bit like that view, their view. We're getting angry at the stick. And it's not a useful thing, because it, you know, it's just a view, a fleeting view. It comes and goes. It's an opinion. It's an idea. It's a thought. It's a moment of what's traveling through my mind about this situation. That's all it is. And when we grab it, it's like we've grabbed that stick and we're going to hold on to it and we're going to really have it out with this stick. I mean, how useful is that? All it does is make more conflict and more confusion and more pain. So it's always said, if someone hurts or harms me, beats me or slanders me, don't let it affect you. 
see it as the stick. And this stick can be a very useful tool. When it's hit over your shoulders in sitting a long time in meditation, you get stiff, you're no longer really clear in your mind. One little whack on the shoulder. It's more the sound in Korea. In Japan, it was quite a hard hit. But in Korea, it's just the bamboo split, so it's more clap, clap sound. That it's a very interesting sound when it hits on the shoulder. And it's a very refreshing thing. Oh, thank you. Now I can meditate again. So the stick can be a very useful tool. Someone else's or your own upset is a very useful tool. If we can be with it, have the patience to be present. And the third form of forbearance, uh, the third aspect, is to understand the Buddhist teachings on emptiness. And here we are talking about uh, the mind that is beyond its concept of self in this situation. Me and you, them and us. Whatever is identifying me in the situation, if we can have the patience to look into that very deeply, then we see that there is no real ex existence, continuing self in that situation. It's not so easy unless you meditate, but still developing patience on its own as a parent to a child again. They look, they watch, they give some sort of guidance. The child gets very angry. Does the parent always have to scream and cry and get angry too? Then we, the child starts to wonder, well, who's the parent here? And then they start to work it out. Wow, I can work this game too. So sometimes these things get confused and also grow with this idea of me and mine. And so patience allows us this space to see what is actually going on beyond the labels and beyond the ideas. The fourth parami is enthusiastic perseverance. So the patience at times becomes, you know, a lot of effort. This is part of the parami of right effort. And this perseverance um, is, uh, it means the vira vira, the Sanskrit word vira vira, it means to overcome with strength and courage and bravery. We have a saying in Zen, you know, uh, the whole of the Zen practice is to have great strength, great courage and great perseverance. Because these are, are a foundation for how we can live in very difficult situations. And it is also the foundation that helps us develop what's called right energy, diligence, and the aspect of effort within a virtue. It overcomes laziness, idleness, and the mind that sits in an apathetic state it is a mind that also is a, um, is very confused. Without some sort of enthusiastic perseverance of staying with our states, particularly, you know, when we're um, meditating, to stay with that focus of concentration or at our workplace to stay with what is the task at hand, or that parent staying with what the children are wanting right now. I remember my mother used to just say, oh, go and get it, or she'd be doing something, but she wouldn't even look sometimes. Or there'd just be no, and I'd say, mum, you haven't listened to me. No, not now. <laughs> it was actually not a no, you can't do it, it was a no, not now. 
and I would think, oh, okay. So the aspects of this per, per, a perseverance is like wearing armour. They say in Mahayana, it's like you come protected. So the Dharma and the virtue of perseverance gives you protection. It gives you um, the ability to walk out into, we well, say, the battlefield of many problems and feel reassured, feel confident, feel okay, even if it's not a great protection. To feel okay is important. To feel it's enough to just present up to be there, to do it. And again, it is uh, to develop this strength so we can go into any situation for the benefit of helping others. Each of these virtues, these parami, are not only for just benefiting me, but they are for benefiting others and other situations. Ordinary people are getting this notion now. I mean, I don't know about in the political circle quite what's going on there, but <laughs> there seems to be a lot of benefiting me going on, and I hope it doesn't reflect too much in our society, but it is a worry when, for many who see the politicians as uh, someone who is guiding us, even ethically at times, you know, well, I suggest you look elsewhere. And another one, another aspect of this is to be um, sufficiently, always feel sufficiently inspired in what it is we're doing. So we're making a choice to be here and do this. It's important to feel that that choice is a worthy choice. You've made a choice to come here and listen to this talk today. Some of you sat all yesterday, even Bhante sitting there, who was leading you. He's still sitting. <laughs> he could have said, oh, bowed and walked out. But you know, we're making a choice. So what it is, we, what is it we are taking in? What is it we are doing with these teachings? What is it we are taking away and how is it we're going to use them? This is all part of this uh, perseverance with the Dhamma, perseverance with the practice. The fifth parami is the dhyana. Oh, wait a minute, there was something else I just didn't um, touch on there, unless I've moved it. Yes, um, there's two other aspects I didn't touch on. The second aspect is applying yourself to all, using this enduring capacity to apply yourself to work with all the virtues. And that's another characteristic of my teacher. She never turned away. Everything became, for her, in that moment, what her life was about, what it was she was bringing to it. So whether she was talking to a builder, and they built many beautiful buildings for the 200 nuns to live in and study in, they built up the temple, whether it was listening to visitors for two hours, whether it was working with students or teachers. I remember I would walk around the temple with her and she would just point to the ground and I'd look and I'm looking, looking, looking and she'd hold her finger there and there was a little nail and I'd always carry a bag to pick up the rubbish, you know, so I'd have to pick up a little nail and the nail goes to the pile of metal or it was a glove that was half in the ground that somebody had a work glove that had got forgotten and got buried and I'd have to dig out the glove. Or it was a, a rock that was in the wrong place or a piece of wood that had fallen from the tree. These 
They might seem little things, but when every aspect of your day is dealing with what um, is before us, then perseverance no longer is a perseverance. It's no longer an, an endurance. It's no longer difficult. Because in the moment we're dealing with it. In the moment it is this person who has a, an issue, has something to share. In the moment it's a child crying. In the moment it's the boss asking something of me. We deal with it. I mean, I've got a lot to deal with my property, so I shouldn't talk too personally on this level. Um, and the third is never turning back. Never turning away, never turning back. Never, um, you know, this irre it's an irreversible determination with a strong resolve we have here. And the reason we have that what is the reason we have it? Anyone? Because we want to reach Nibbana. We want to reach some stage of the fruit of our practice. And here in this case of the Bodhisattva path, or Mahayana practitioners, same practitioners. We want to cultivate these virtues, which is what makes a bodhisattva. Without the virtue, there is, there is a person. Maybe we're good meditators or we're cultivating one aspect, which is coming up, the meditation concentration aspect. But it's not enough to be a wholesome human being. And that's what a bodhisattva is developing, the wholesomeness of not only our humanity, but what the mind can offer to all beings, all existence. So in here we have the dhyana, which is the, uh, the construct of the mind, the mental thoughts. And it is to develop the mind in a way to concentrate so it does not become distracted. It can stay with this attentive, present, open awareness. It's to maintain the mind to focus in one point without any disturbance. And our mind tends to be distracted. So right, this, the, 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 the capacity of the right effort, the patience, the sila, and the giving, the relinquishing side of giving is what is going to stabilize the mind in clarity and focus. Without all the parami working here, the mind can wander very easily. We don't have the strength and the stability to stay in one place. I mean, I hope when I'm 88, I can sit upright like that, like my teacher for two hours or more. Sometimes it's several hours. And she'll sit up like that for two hours teaching the teachers three times a week, you know, and that means concentrating on every line of the text and disseminating her knowledge and wisdom on that. So, you know, she's done that for 50 years. And the mind is very present. Even when I go, her eyes don't leave mine. They just stay very connected even at this age. So an aspect of meditation and concentration is being able to maintain ourself or yourself within the concentration subject. So being able to hold that subject. And this is uh, um, developed through enhancing and cultivating 
the capacities of that meditation, that object of meditation or that meditation practice. Each meditation practice has different qualities, different capacities. Whether they're using the, the physical senses such as the eyes or the ears. As um, I was listening to a talk by a Korean nun who teaches the practice of, of cooking in temples um, around the world and she said the purpose of, of preparing and cooking and eating food is for one purpose. So our body and mind is healthy for the benefit and in the temple in particular so it will lead the body so it can practice. So you have too much of certain foods, it makes the body very sluggish, the mind very tired. You have too much um, too little of, of nourishment, then of course again we are weak. And so this is for her the focus in what is essentially important. So she only cooks with three, um, you might say like salt, three spices, peppers, red peppers uh, or chili and I think the other one is um, ginger or it might be soy sauce. I can't remember which, but then there's only a few things that she adds as a, um, a to flavor the food. And then the foods are very simple. Mostly they're just mountain vegetables or vegetables she grows and, and, uh, and rice. So she has a very simple way of teaching how to live very simply. And I remembered, it reminded me of when I lived in my hermit hermitage, I had a very simple routine of what was left over from the meal the day before became the breakfast. And we just cooked up as a porridge for the breakfast. But the food was very simple and the living was very simple. And this was all so I could maintain the concentration from one action to the next. All actions became a meditation. And that is also again what my teacher has taught. The next aspect of meditation is the concentration itself, which is to gain um, uh, concentration is where it, from the samadhi, samatha practices, it is where the mind centers in this moment. And what happens is it becomes very spacious, becomes very calm, and it becomes very present. And that is the purpose of concentration. Of course, developed, you might develop various powers, but its main purpose is to develop the stability to be present. And it is called calm abiding because it's a place where you can abide very calmly in deep states of calm. And the other aspect of meditation in all traditions is that of insight or vipassana. And what that does, it allows us to look into that, through that calm state of mind, into that moment that gives us insight into the reality of things as they are. In this moment, it allows us to have that insight to see clearly what is causing the ripples of mind, what is causing the distractions, what is causing the mind to move, what is causing the interest in various physical sensations or emotions. We have that capacity to look into them and look through them to the source. That is called insight. And the sixth parami is, oh, well, there is an aspect, another aspect, that when we go very deeply into meditation, that those two, the samatha and the vipassana, uh, they connect in some sense of, of deep concentration, deep wisdom. And... Um, 
or they connect in the sense of when you go enter into the uh, deeper states of samadhi and jhana, where there is no separation, there is no internal, external, the objects of our senses no longer play um, in the mind, they no longer distract and disturb. And this leads to wisdom, the sixth parami. Pra is, is the word of um, perfectly knowing or understanding. And the jar is to arrive at uh, this clear understanding, to arrive at it, to, to come to this place of deep understanding. So wisdom means understanding this reality right here, right now, with no shadow, no fault. It is not, it doesn't mislead or confuse. And it is a phenomenon that will help us deeply understand how to act and work with other. Without wisdom, Adana Parami may be a, a lot of giving, but with not knowing what it is that giving is going to lead to. It can actually lead to a lot of harm. Without wisdom, and I've seen people who come to the temple who continue to work in fields that can hurt others and, and lead to, you know, crime or lead to ill health. And that would just mean that you will always feel uncomfortable on a very deep level. You'll always feel shame and guilt and sadness on a deep level when you cannot uh, use wisdom through right livelihood, through the giving, whatever it is your life can do that can give. If you do not apply with wisdom, it will not benefit you or others. Maybe in the short term, but not in the long term. Its aspect is understanding ultimate reality. It's its realization of one of the fruits of the path. In uh, the Mahayana it, and the Bodhisattva, there is the view that uh, you practice not only this life, but you take what you develop from this life into your next and you develop these perfections so they become more and more refined. So we would say all the great teachers in our existence now have refined those capacities over many lifetimes, such as the Buddha. And that at some point, um, you, there's a very long path in Mahayana that you enter into being a Buddha in some moment of time somewhere. Uh, but before then, your life is to develop these parami, develop these perfections through the cultivation of wisdom. It is to understand or know also how to benefit not only sentient, not only living things, but that which we use in this world with moderation, with care, with kindness, because if we take it very greedily, then it will not sustain. This world will not sustain. And the third is to know how to teach it properly, how to guide people with wisdom, how to teach the laws of causality, and how to teach how to use our thoughts and actions that show a very clear path for others to follow. That is, how do we act in accord with wisdom, with wise parami, you might say, with parami being practiced in a wise way. Each of these aspects um, 
as I've just touched on, are to be cultivated together. Material generosity is not just about giving to the poor or giving food, but giving in a way that will be sustainable and that will benefit in future generations. So um, that is what I've put down as my notes. Um, and I thank my uh, great uh, inspiration with Venerable Myung Song Sinim. Um, we always use the word Sinim after our names because that means like Bante or Venerable. Um, a lay person just has the name like Chi Guang, but uh, we always have Chi Guang Sinim or Myung Song Sinim or whatever, whatever Sinim. And people can call me or any monastic snib on its own. But it is important that whoever our teachers are, whoever we feel can guide us, that we are inspired by their teachings. Not only from what it is they know, but how they live their life. What it is they do. That is very important. And you will have many mentors in life, many people who inspire you. And how is it that that inspiration is being used? You know, what have you taken from their lives that you've brought into your own life that benefits you and others? This is how to grow your parami. And teachers are very important for that. So thank you again for patience of listening to all of this. <laughs> I didn't know how to um, give the story of the Bodhisattva in a way that would, you know, be easily understood. It's a complex study. But I think we both share, all traditions share these basic fundamental teachings, which is the most important thing. The Theravada share the parami, the Zen practices share the parami. We're all cultivating these qualities the Buddha has taught us. And we all know that when we practice them, our minds and our actions are in accord with this truth. Because it gives us joy. It gives us pleasure. It makes our hearts feel very fulfilled. So thank you again for coming. And may the parami guide you in your life in these coming days and weeks and years. Mahabanya Paramilta. And I offer the benefits of this teaching to you all and in particular to my dear old Venerable Sanim, Young Song Sanim. Thank you. Oh, I didn't ask, is there any questions? <laughs> Very quickly, might have a couple of minutes. Yes. 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 Sunim, excuse my ignorance. Did Buddha teach Bodhisattva path? And also, um, did I understand that in Bodhisattva path, they do not have the uh, um, intention to attain Nibbana? Uh, so, well, I wasn't around at the time of the Buddha, so I don't know exactly, well, I don't have recollection of what the Buddha taught. Um, from the Mahayana teachings, they have their sources of, and they go back a very long way. Actually, the oldest, oldest of any records come from Mahayana text. The oldest texts are not Theravada, they're Mahayana. Um, they have a view that the Buddha did not only teach humans, and we know from Theravada texts and all the comparative texts that the Buddha taught in many realms. And so, in the, from 
the Nagarjuna teachings, which are over to a thousand years old, they talk about, um, and there's not just him, but the earlier texts talk about the Buddha teaching in these, uh, these higher um, realms, heavenly realms, teachings that he felt that humans couldn't understand at that time. And in that, those teachings, the, the purpose of the cultivation of the Bodhisattva, which may well have been developed later, I'm not going to argue, I'm not a scholar, to argue one way or another, it's a very complex subject. We have to be very careful when we just, I often hear, you know, very critical things about this tradition or that tradition and their source and their source. I don't go there. But at the same time, the texts I find suit some people, some minds, some cultures. And they're quite analytical, they're quite thorough, and they have very good reasoning, you know, for why you develop in this way. Whether when you attain a certain level you go into Nibbana, and whether you don't, I think this is also perhaps a little speculative. I, we asked my teacher once, you know, why don't we practice to go into the Nibbanic path? And he said, well, in the Bodhisattva path, to be reborn, you actually have to have a vow. You know, you need that vow to take you down that particular strain, which reconnects you to teachers that you have connected with in the past. So you continue to develop these paramis. So every time you come back into a life, you come back and you can offer more from the virtue of greater understanding, you know, earlier on in your life. It doesn't mean that you're a Buddha and, and it, it doesn't mean that, you know, um, you, you may not take um, the Nibbanic path. You may not choose, you know, but it would be the re-taking of the vow in each lifetime that would re-strengthen you on that body. It re-strengthens that connection with the teacher. So it re-strengthens that particular path. As you see, specifically in Tibetan Buddhism, it's very strongly noted. But we all traditions have known young incarnations even in Sri Lanka, you know, come back and say, oh, it's such and such, and I studied this and did that. And, and sometimes they have wonderful recall for the, um, the Dhamma. You know, as a child, we know of some who are living now who were reborn in Theravada traditions who can recite the texts as a child. This is part of what they've developed in that lifetime. But, you know, someone like me, I feel I have a foot in both camps. <laughs> I've studied Mahayana and I've studied a little of Theravada, not as much as Bhante sitting next to me, of course. And um, so I haven't cultivated in this way. But maybe I've cultivated in another way. And uh, I'm quite happy with studying both. Maybe next life I'll go to a Theravada country and have to do Pindapada every day. <laughs> Very possibly here I am sitting at the BSV giving talks, so <laughs> that might be making connections in new ways. Mm. And if I'm reborn to be a, if that's, I bring some of the Bodhisattva into that life, Wonderful, you know, who's going to complain? I mean, Achambram has that quality, really, you know. He has a big mind and big heart and travels everywhere and has tireless energy. He has more the Bodhisattva than I do. I live up on a mountain on my own. And <laughs> yeah, so good. Any other questions, quickly? Yeah. Chikuan, um with the parami of um, patience that you were mm. describing, you know, when I look at patience or when I think about patience, you know, I, I think about it like, you know, um, the kettle will boil or the, um, if I'm a hundred lines, hundred deep in a line, 
um, waiting, waiting for something, you know, <laughs> I, I will get to the front of the line. Well, that's good patience. Most people are standing behind some old, old Diddy at the post office and worrying about, well, when are they going to hurry up, you know? <laughs> so that's good. But, but I think the way that you were describing patience was a little bit different. It wasn't based on mm. the kettle will boil. It was, well, you will get to the front of the line. It was yeah. the way I had it. Was well, the, you, you've already developed some. There was another aspect I realised I didn't touch on this. The, the mental aspects of all of these um, are, because you're coming from wisdom, are the realisation that, uh, you know, some things are inevitable. Like you put a kettle on, then the process of the capacity of fire and the kettle and water in the kettle, you know, there are these, these fundamental core uh, conditions that would suggest, well, given time, the kettle will boil. It. And, and doing it many, many times in our lifetime, we come to that. It's not an aspect. We don't have to be patient about a kettle boiling. But there are many things in our life, our relationships, our worst workplace environments that require us to be very vigilant in, in that or develop that capacity to be with and not act out and not, you know, react and not hurt others with our impatience. Or hurt ourselves primarily too. Mm. But the, the, there is many things that we've already done many, many times and we're okay about doing those. We know that to get that result, we have to go through that process. You know, to bake a cake, you have to go through the process of making it. But there is intention involved. So what is the intention? What outcome do you want out of a situation? And then there is the processes of getting from here to there. And how am I going to do that? And often that will require to study something, learn something, communicate it, a lot of patience. To sit in meditation requires a lot of patience. We all have so many excuses not to do it. because this quality hasn't been developed. Um, another aspect of patience, um, which has the perseverance with it, um, you know, because we can say, you know, do we, are we patient with the politics that's going on? But there is also an aspect of patience which requires us to, to act to make change too. It's not just saying, oh, well, I'm going to be patient with all, all this rubbish all the time. You, that's where the wisdom comes in, is to know where to act in an appropriate way. And then how long do we stay with something until it's no longer of value and use? When do we let it go? also requires wisdom. Does this make sense? <laughs> Good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so I think it's uh, our lunchtime now, so um, you're welcome to stay and share.